Okay, uh, here we're going to talk about using method of forces to solve sets and determine axial problems. Uh, so remember, we talked about this sort of problem, and uh, here it's statically determined because obviously uh, we can always use some of the forces in the x direction. So we have two unknown reactions external reaction forces, the external reaction force A, and the external reaction force C. So the way of this previously is we supplemented the sum of forces in the x direction, which was the full line diagram. Well, I'll shoot it over. I would say it should be in the same place. Here's FA, here's the reaction force FC, and so the sum of forces. We supplement that equation because we have two unknowns with the uh, compatibility condition or the displacement constraint that's imposed by the additional constraint at C. You could also be right there, but the additional constraint at C. And that means that this total elongation or elongation of C relative to So we, we went through and got this in terms of the external reaction force FA and FC, and that provides us two equations for the two unknowns, FA and FC, and allows us to solve. Right? And uh, that's one approach, it's sort of the direct approach. But I'm going to show you an alternate approach, um, which is kind of nice. Um, method of forces, it, it allows you to not handle systems of equations, you can use numbers, and then you refer to numbers and variables. It also, um, in some sense, some problems with the calculations a little easier. Uh, you definitely have to use it for more complicated problems, actually, to the question. But anyway, uh, I must kind of emphasize the fact that if you don't understand this basic approach, how we're doing this, why we're doing this, the fact that we have uh, un, you know, a static or indeterminate problem. You don't understand that there's the, uh, where this displacement constraint comes about. Method of forces is not going to help, okay? So you, you need to understand how to do this approach before you do method of forces. At that point, you can Choose which one you like better. If you don't like method of forces, you really don't have to use it. To do it. The other one is fine. Okay. So, what method of forces does is it uses uh, the notion of superposition we talked about. It allows you to break up this problem into two other problems. So, basically, Think of the following problem. Let's see what line. Consider just the 20 millimeter force. So that's one problem. And superimpose on that the second problem. Where we just consider the effect of this tip force operating on this P. Call this problem two. Okay? Where this geometry is the same as this geometry still fixed at the left end, but we're just considering the, 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 uh, the twenty kilonewton force and then this unknown reaction force separately. If you think about it, you know, if you superimpose these two problems, you get the same as this problem, 
provided that the total elongation is zero. Maybe I should say that wrong. If you look at it, you consider this problem. This is the tip elongation. That equals basically this problem. Right. These two problems superimpose to this problem. Now this is different than this one because you know I've removed that constraint. <coughs> So this is the what you so you, you so what makes it equivalent is we again have to recognize the fact that you want to find p basically such that delta one plus delta two equals zero. All right. So we want to find p such that this elongation is equal to the negative of this, right? So, um, imagine it in this sort of thought process. Uh, we have a redundant constraint, so now let's remove it and go through a thought experiment where we kind of come up with the same net result. So we remove that constraint. Now, just consider the 20 kilometers. Obviously, that will stretch this section out by delta 1. Now, we want to find P that will basically push the bar back the same amount so that this uh, you know, equals the negative this, and therefore, when we consider effectively both of them together, this basically gives you this problem. So this really becomes nothing more than that unknown external reaction force in FC, although I've drawn it in another direction. Right? Okay. So uh, the reason why superposition helps is because let's say we go through this problem and find out that the delta is um, one millimeter. Okay? It's one millimeter. Now what we can do here actually assume a value of P. Normally we assume it to be like one, one kilometer. Now, if we solve this problem where this is one kilometer, and let's say this becomes uh, minus two millimeters, right? Minus two millimeters. Then that's twice as much as you really needed to balance out this thing. This is only stretching by one millimeter. So that means force P needs to be half of what you assume to be. So in this case, it's 500 uh, meters, half of one kilometer. Okay? That's the logic. Okay? I'll, of course, I'll go through it, but I just want to explain the logic of the problem. So by breaking it up into its two parts, you can consider the effect of this by itself. And then that lets you scale it in such a manner that you can then figure out, you know, okay, this stretches by like, one millimeter, this compresses by two millimeters, so this force is twice as big as it is. But the only way you can do that correctly is to just consider the effect singularly of that one force. So what you basically do is you take your statically indeterminate problem, you remove one of the extra constraints, and then you break it up into two problems. One where you have all the forces except that unknown reaction force. So this, if there were other external forces here or here at this point, they would be here. And then you consider the same problem with just the unknown reaction force which you exposed by removing that constraint. C. So you can figure out what that should be to basically negate the elongation that Okay, so that's the way it works. Again, the nice thing about it is we can actually put a number in here and solve through the process. Okay, so that's the approach. All right. Um, let's do 
don't do it. So that being said, let's first do the first problem. Now these are obviously, you know, and the nice thing is these are both standard determining problems. So let's just consider the first problem. All right. So we want to find delta one. Okay. So this is pretty easy. So if you look at this, there's only an internal reaction force in section A. Uh, section B, C, you know, draw. This free body diagram, you see immediately that the internal reaction force here, A D, step one, is equal to 20, right? And then if you look at section C, you can see there's nothing on here. Point C, obviously, in B C for the first case. Okay, so there's no internal reaction force in this section, only in this section. Actually, elongation of C. the total bar, elongation of C relative to A for this first case is really just the elongation of section AB. Section B is the Just as well. 20 kilonewtons, that's the force, the length is 0.4 meters, uh, the cross sectional area is 20 uh, minus 6 meters squared. I feel like it's the warm up, really. Back to the universe. It's so old, it's so bad. Mm -hmm.
two moves. So I should like this one. It's kind of a ball right? So that says if we just consider this low low, this point moves out. Point, I'm oh, sorry, two millimeters. Okay? That's how it's out. Okay, now let's just consider P. And I'm going to assume P is one point. Because one scale. So you see that. So if you consider the second. So you can pick it to be, you can assume it to be anything. So you know, we're just going to do this sort of logic argument of scaling it so it equals two millimeters. But why not just So now we need to figure out the elongation here takes two, right? That's so that's the elongation takes two of uh, E relative to A plus the elongation takes two of C relative to B. Now in this case, the internal reaction force is the same in both these. Uh, it's two kilonewtons in compression. So basically this behaves as if it were just one Rod, same cross-sectional area, but a length of um, 1.2 meters, right? 400 millimeters plus 8 meters. So, I mean, forget this collar. It's just, it's just a single ball. So, in this case, you know, five, six, this thing is correct. Uh, this is going to be Minus one kilonewton, uh, right? That's the internal reaction force. The length is 1.2 meters, and then plus section area is 20, so minus 6 meters squared, 200 to the 9 pascals. And that gives me m. That gives me minus point two zero millimeters. Okay? So what do we see here? Well, actually it's point two one, probably a point two one. It's pretty easy to see it there. Um, excuse me. So you can see this moves this in, this is equal to, we assume that this load here is equal to 1 kilonewton. This means that this edge moves in 0.2 millimeters. Okay, now, if it had moved it in 2 millimeters, then obviously the answer would be that that reaction force at C should be one kilometer, right? But it did. So it needs to be ten times that, right? So you need to have uh, reaction force actually ten times that. So that means that actually P should equal uh, instead of one kilometer, you need ten kilometers. Right? Since this is off by a factor of 10, we need to make P 10 times bigger so that it moves it you know, 10 times more. So P should have been 10 kilometers, right? At which point then, uh, now we can put that into the whole body, back out the other. So really what we have is 10 kilometers here, 20 kilometers. That means this needs to be Okay?
not enough, right? We use the same logic. So that means that if it were one kilometer, we would move it in 0.3 millimeters. All right. Well, it needs to be more than that, right? If we doubled it, it would go to 0.6, and so on and so forth. So we need to scale P by um, 2 over 0.3. That'll give us the right value. So, two. so that is six point six seven kilograms. It should be right here. So that's what we got to do, right? So that tells us that P is actually go back. So this should be six point six seven kilograms. So that means from some of forces, this has to be. Those are the reaction forces in that problem. So, <clears throat> sorry about that, so I need to talk about that here. So, but again, just to review the concept. So there's a lot of steps. So it's, you know, it is kind of powerful, but you have to get the, the approaches in the So I'm just going to do real quickly. We have a statically indeterminate problem. We're going to break that into two statically indeterminate problems. So we're going to remove this constraint. Now we have uh, this problem and this problem. The reason we choose this second problem is because we can just look at the effect singularly of the unknown external reaction force. All the other forces, all the other loads go into the first problem. Okay? We just expose the effect of this. We don't want to. So this way, if the elongation here is half of what it needs to be, we just double the value. Right? Okay. And then the logic is find this such that it cancels this displacement. Because that's the compatibility. So go through, we find how much it actually it elongates if we just had that in three, that two millimeters. And then we go back and we actually just pick an arbitrary value, although again, unity is always a nice number, one, right? And we just consider one kilometer out here. Again, if just happened to work out that it was minus two millimeters, then that would have been the end. But it, it's not, typically. It comes out to be something else. So here it's 0.3 millimeters. So it needs to be greater, right? So that this becomes 0.2 millimeters. Now from linearity, you know, if you double the force, you double the elongation, or in this case, the traction. So in this case, we need to scale the force by two over That's the way you do it. If you had more than one redundant constraint, you would have to consider three uh, scenarios in your supervision. But you can do that. Okay. All right. That's it. Uh, look over some of the example problems where you do this. It's not a bad method, uh, but you do have to keep the approach straight in your head. This is definitely one of those problems where you don't uh, have a good understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. We really want to do time to uh, solve it. Although I know it's tempting because uh, you don't have to solve systems. Okay?